The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, Steph, let's go into uh, Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz. Obviously, I Golden and Katz focus on the big picture issue, which is what you have drawn for us in the big picture, um, <laughs> pun semi-intended. Um, and the, the, a consideration that I had was on the research and development process, which is not something that they touched on here, which could maybe provide a short-term fix and I'd love to hear your input. Is there in the research and development process people who openly talk about the ways in which their technology may cause social disruption? And if so, can you identify someone you know, on a project that you've worked on or a firm that you know of that's concerned about the social or economic implications of the technologies that they are building? Don't we see this like all the time? They decide. Oh, they don't. <laughs> um, but they might decide, like, this is my niche, this is what I haven't seen before, and, like, these are the reasons why uh, this particular technology would, like, take advantage of this unseen sort of market. And so I don't know if that's what you're trying to get at with. No, I think, I think your point was, like, okay, if we do this, it will change society this way. Like, Uber said, okay, if we do this, this technology will get rid of all these cab drivers, and there's going to be, like, a social disruption. Is that your kind of, like, Angle? Sort of, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think your angle was more like, oh, this is going to be a huge hit, and it's really going to change like society, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So, in I guess in my consideration of business and consumer markets, and and in some of the research that I'm conducting for my paper on autonomous vehicles, uh, one of the questions that I've been tasked to ask by anthropologists to firms that I might be interviewing, or even as I'm going over, you know, literature base and public releases to the press is essentially who on the staff is in charge of answering questions or raising considerations about social disruption or economic disruption that your technology might cause. And if a firm can't answer that, then you have your answer that they're not that they don't consider that as a part of their research and development process. And I think it's possible that some people would argue that that's beyond the scope of what the firm should be doing, right? They should be focusing on the technology. They perhaps should not have an ethicist, you know, that they should, maybe, or perhaps they should just have an ethicist that they consult with, but it should not be someone who's, you know, sort of formally a part of their staff. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this as perhaps a short-term fix as we, you know, sort of promote technological advances. Should there be someone who's constantly, you know, raising a flag and saying, huh, perhaps this might not be a good idea to deploy in the time frame that we have set for ourselves? So I'm working on the Mobility of the Future project as part of my thesis, and so a lot of it is with autonomous vehicles. And it does seem, well, first of all, like with that example specifically, a lot of the companies who are working on it are very secretive about what they're doing, so it's like not very clear as to like, what's going on within the companies. But outside of them, at least with this example, there is a lot of um, work and awareness about the potential disruptions. Um, I question whether that's always been the case or kind of the recent disruptions have like spurred people to think about this more. Um, so like there's a group at the MIT Age Lab, I don't know if you've talked to them. The what's that? Age Lab. Age. Age? Like AGE. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, they do a lot of stuff related to like how people are aging, but um, they also have a big group that's working on the autonomous vehicles. Um, less so on the technology side, but how it's like affecting people. So they have a lot of um, experiments where they're like letting people drive autonomous cars and like recording them with their consent. And they're trying to get knowledge about like how people are interacting with these technologies, like what changes it could have, like what negative changes it could have. So like they showed us a video of this guy who's like looking down at his phone for like two minutes while driving like on the mass pike, which is terrifying. Um, <laughs> and so like as we transition from like a, a not quite autonomous vehicle to like a fully one, like he's talking about how he expects to see like more accidents in the near future until we get to the point. So I think people are thinking about like. The, how these technologies and their developments affect things other than just like how we're getting from place to place. It's not like such a simple story. And would you mind uh, elaborating 
the, the reason I bring up this point and why I've been thinking about it so fully is because Bill assessed that a, a very important component of driverless vehicles is the impact that it's going to have on the workforce, right, on truck drivers and on, you know, delivery laborers. Um, do you think that those are considerations that have been raised, you know, vis-a-vis -vis driverless cars? And do you think that there's maybe a role for someone to be highlighting that as an issue within each innovation team? Yeah, I I feel like that hasn't been as much of a focus in our work. Like people talk about it, but no one really talks about. It. They're like, that's going to be a problem, <laughs> and that's like the end of the discussion <laughs> from what I've seen so far. But I do think that that is, especially after this election, people are talking more and more about like disruptive technologies. Like I hadn't heard people talk about it much, but then I was listening to a podcast today where someone was like, I noticed in. Um, Logan, the movie. Just about to Wait, oh my gosh. if you spoil it, I, I haven't swear. Seen it. No. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> um, in the movie, Logan, apparently, I haven't seen it. You might be a better job describing. But there's a scene where there's like all these trucks around, and none of them have cabs because they're driving themselves. And there's like a senator talking about this, and she's like, "Wow, like this really could happen." And then like, what happens to all of these like truck drivers? Like, I never thought about it until I saw Logan. So like, I think that's interesting how it's like permeating. To, so like, so. I want to hold this discussion until next week's class, okay. which is about the future of work. I mean, it's exactly like it's about this problem. So, you know, we've, we've gotten it on the table. Everybody's going to have a chance to think about it. And you can go back and watch Logan. You can recount your favorite stories. But Steph, do bring this up again when we go after these issues next week. But focus is more now on Cats and Golden and Baumol, if you would. Okay. Thank I you. Been redirected. <laughs> um, I'm so, not trying to silence you, Steph. No, no, I promise you airtime in the I, next class. <laughs> well, I think, um, I guess one of you know, my critiques of my social science education, and I think this is generally my critique of social science education generally, is that there are benefits to talking about an issue, but there's only so much that sort of pu like public discourse can get you, especially like on, in a roundtable setting in an academic environment where the most of us, you know, sort of feel like for the most part are on the same side of an issue. <clears throat> um, so I struggle to come up with, you know, sort of good questions and think about what might actually be meaningful as we're having a conversation about an issue as large and as difficult to grapple with as inequality, especially as a, um, as cats in golden, purport it, um, but I think one of you talked about how relative to Baumol's analysis, um, if America should shift towards a focus on primarily promoting breakthrough innovations where we can still maintain competitive advantages in the research and development system, rather than even concerning ourselves at all with you know, the fixing of the education system or the fixing of the R&D pipeline. Um, and this sort of hints at a question that Matt had asked earlier in the semester, where he said, is the impetus on us as a civil society to, educa to educate everyone? Is that even advantageous to us? Do people even want to be educated? And what are the benefits of you know, putting it, making this resource available to all when it seems like we're already failing spectacularly at this experiment that is, you know, the United States of America. I think we're failing. It's yeah. 300 years old. And that's like relatively short. We're still figuring our stuff out, like in terms of nations, right? Yeah, I think we did pretty well. Yeah. Not great, not more, but I mean, so I let's think, make I think, it great again. I think it's kind of like bubble thinking, like people losing their minds and sensationalism. I think it's more like, because their argument is pretty much like, it's like saying, oh yeah, we have McDonald's, everything's set up to do McDonald's, but we need Chipotle. How do we make McDonald's like the burger of Chipotle, right? It's like, you really can't change one system to like a whole new one. What you do is you have to make Chipotle and then make Chipotle a pop and chain. Like you have to go make the next system. And like, yeah. I'm going to use this metaphor. Okay, it's I mean, because people are freaking out. It's like, yo, this hamburger just can't be a burrito. I'm like, why? Well, the whole infrastructure is made to make hamburgers. Right? Well, see, and I think that at the heart of what you're saying, you know, to sort of elucidate where I'm coming from and asking this question, um, there's a, an education professor um, who I grew close to during my time at Wellesley who, in his first day of his PhD program, his advisor posed to everyone, if you had the option, would you blow up the education system and start again, or would you change it incrementally? And his answer was, blow it up. 
and start over. Right, but we don't have that option. We don't have the privilege of you know bringing in the Chipotle's and then seeing if they work and then adapting all the McDonald's to suit that consumer market. Right, like we 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 very much recognize that students are humans and that humans have a very particular ethics consideration than do technologies or other kinds of research and development projects. So, if we are to meet the kinds of goals that Golden and Katz and Baumol and Freeman are advocating for in improving our education system, right? How do we deal with the fact that these are human lives with whom we are experimenting? I think it's a good point for that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm trying to say is like, what are we defining as education? Are we defining education as I want people to know math and science really well to be able to communicate it, to think yeah, innovatively in it? Or are we defining it as like, we're gonna get out of a four year college? Right? So I think a lot of this argument is the current infrastructure or the relationship for the last 100 years has been colleges. So we define education as graduating at college. But like if you make it as I want to make the best, most educated person with all my tools right now um, and be able to port them into society well in terms of into jobs really well, how would we make that ideal system? You start making that system and it's not going to change overnight, right? Like, you know, like you don't grow up two years old and, you know, next day you're, I mean, there is the movie 13 going on 30, but like, it's it's very rare, right? I mean, then, <laughs> so I think it's, you start making the new system and you kind of start to port over. Um, there's a whole issue with trying to change a current system because they're already playing, well, this happens with uh, later mature markets. Um, what happens is there's gonna be three or four or five players, right? So we talk about institutions. We have Harvard, MIT, Stanford. They're trying to fight against each other because they don't wanna, it's hard to be different when you have to compete against someone um, like that. And so they have to play their games. Um, the, the reason an innovator can come in is because they don't have to play that um, keeping up with the Jones's game. Um, that's my point. You're throwing out a lot of metaphors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Station, Chipotle. <laughs> it's like, okay, so there's a big part. So there's a, whole, there's a whole book on communication where it's like, if you make, I could explain in like a super technical way, but you're not gonna get it, and I can say something like that, and you're like, okay, kind of. Um, and then well, also, we're <laughs> <don't>, <laughs> the thing is like, you won't forget it, because it's so out there, that you're like, okay, like, okay. Chipotle. Like, well, you're gonna, I'm definitely going to remember, like, the three points, right? Well, no, I remember that Chipotle versus Burger King, McDonald's, was discussed. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, let me say something here, too, which is that we are going to dig into the textbook reading on legacy sectors, because there's no question, but education and higher education in particular are legacy systems. And the whole issue of how do you bring change into legacy systems is kind of an underlying theme here. So I'm glad we're right at the brink of trying to figure this out. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, you know, posit that the meaning of Freeman's reading for us, I think, was that there are real economic consequences to your leadership in science and engineering, in the science and engineering talent base. And that Katz and Golden take us to kind of a next step um, and enable us to address a larger set of societal problems and tie it significantly to the education system. In other words, the growing problem of the polarization of our society and the growing income inequality in our society that will affect the quality of the democracy and, <coughs> and probably already is, that's very much tied to these curves here and how we're moving, what portion of the population we're moving onto that upward technology curve and what portion of the population we're leaving behind. That's, that's the meaning of that crossover point in the, in the 1970s. And what are the policies that would really address trying to get those lines back into parallel, right? Because that seems to me a pretty important societal problem. So Freeman identifies a set of economic issues that lead, that draw us to be concerned with the science and engineering talent base. And Katz and Golden tell us, by the way, there are very deep societal well-being problems that are tied to the education system as well. And then, you know, Baumol points to us and says, you know, by the way, you know, these folks are studying the higher education system, but that's not the only route here. We have to understand this other dimension if you want to introduce innovation into the overall economy, 
education for incremental advance is probably not the only system we ought to be worried about. And that's kind of what Steph's you know, round of questions here was driving at, I think, if I've interpreted you right, which is what is that more disruptive education system that we have to contemplate here if we want to educate not only for incremental advance but for true innovation as well. Is that fair? Sort of. Yeah, I think if from if I were to have a last maybe point or question, I would ask if any. Yeah, why don't you make it? Why don't you make some you know some key points in your mind about what these pieces mean? You just heard my version, but yeah. Um, so I guess I will ask started off with a, a straw poll, as you know, I favor these. Um, how many of you have heard or read Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire? Mm -hmm. Do you know what pedagogy means? Maybe Martin can explain it to us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to rely on Lily for this one. Yeah. Um, so is there is there someone here? So did, was there anyone who had read Pedagogy of the Oppressed? Have any of you ever taken a course in education, education policy? Um, how many of you have very strong Except feelings? for this course, of course. Except for this course. Um, have any of you taken or feel like your stakeholders in a national com or in a conversation about the change in national education policy or in state education policy. Okay, I think we found something. Okay, <laughs> Do, who feels like they're a stakeholder in the education policy realm? I mean, are we all? Are you saying stakeholder or active stakeholder? Like an active stakeholder, like you're willing to show up, you know, to Congress, to go to protests, <laughs> to talk to legislators, blah, 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 blah. Right, and so I think that's, I mean, that kind of highlights to me uh, the divide between the kinds of stuff that Golden Katz, Bommel, Freeman, et cetera, are talking about, right? That it's, and uh, this is, again, again, hinting sort of at my issues with the way in which we teach social sciences, that so much of the Socratic method, which is essentially, you know, Bill explaining to us what it is that we read and then having us sort of flesh it out and debate, you know, in a lively and in a logical way, um, is, right? Like it's, the Socratic method is to get us thinking about what this means truly in implementation and how to grapple with theory. Um, I think, yeah, as you start bringing that up, um, it might have been maybe instructive for us to uh, have a couple of readings by a couple of states who are grappling with sort of education issues and grappling with some issues, particularly those that are like, I am the lead administrator, or I'm in charge of like, the education for maybe like the city of Chicago versus like the state of Illinois and like how they're actually going about um, kind of grappling with these public institutions trying to change these things. Because it's really nice to kind of look at the macroscopic level and be like, okay, we're not graduating enough on the mass, you know, science and engineers. But in reality, education, as we said, because we have this sort of like really distributed model in the US compared to like Sweden, it's like, I'm looking at this, not only like community college by community college, but like state by state and like that's, how folks um, sort of interact with these education sort of issues. And I think maybe to Steph's point and what I'm trying to get um, from her is like, you have these active stakeholders that are really involved in sort of their small pools and like might have a little bit more of an effect um, or like a lot more ideas on like how to innovate within their small pools to get to this state where we want like sort of breakthrough education um, in addition to like incremental advances. And so I think my recommendation would be like, uh, is there someone, maybe in this pedagogy of press book, that can offer an alternative opinion? Are there folks within like who do education professionally and who do educational administration? Do they have these same thoughts and are they worried about these same things? Um, and are they trying to like look at these problems at the same level? Uh, and are there opinions? And I think this is a, a crucial point for me. Are their opinions respected, right? Because a PhD from the you know Stanford Graduate School of Education or the Harvard Graduate School of Education does not mean the same things to most people as a PhD in you know material science from those same institutions. And that that concerns me, right? Because if it's the individuals, there's also I guess an undercurrent in education. And we have mentioned it before in this class of those who can do, those who can't teach. Right, and it is that sort of point of disrespect that we got at at the beginning of class that I think merits far more consideration by this group than do perhaps the contents of the economics reading by Romer. Because if we ourselves are not convinced that teaching is a worthwhile profession and that the education of young people is a worthwhile activity, then who, who, who can be convinced of that? 
right, if we are involved and invested in the promotion of more equitable education in science and technology, because we know that that's the key to driving economic growth and also prosperity and decreasing inequality, right? And so that's why, to me, when Bill says, you know, that Golden and Katz are talking about what are the policies that would address us getting back to a more equitable you know, economic system. To me, it's not about policies, it's about culture, right? It's about our perceptions of other people and what they are doing with their lives and about our distancing of ourselves as, but that's not my issue, that's not my realm, right? So we get to, I think it's unfair and a little bit intellectually irresponsible of us to claim that distance while also critiquing it. Um, so I would posit to all of you that if you you know have time in the next maybe two or three years to pick up this book, Pedagogy of the Press by Freire, What's which was, about? it's about the education system in Brazil and about the ways in which students have been disregarded by the system and conceived of as passive recipients of knowledge rather than as active learners. Mm. and sort of the, the metaphor that he utilizes is that they're receptacles, right? And that we sort of dump in knowledge and that we expect them to regurgitate it out and to be able to apply it in the field. Whereas his understanding of pedagogy, which is the study of teaching and the study of learning, is that individuals have to grapple with something and that's sort of at the heart of what Lily will be talking about um, in the MITx reading when the when they start talking about Seymour Papert, who was a, an, a brilliant professor and researcher at MIT who created the field of constructionism, which is the study of the study of something by doing the something. And that is actually being very widely adopted in Southeast Asia, in countries like Singapore and Thailand, who are you know, experiencing momentous economic advances in the research and development sector. So I think very much you know, pedagogy and considerations of culture uh, become really relevant when we talk about education. Well, I think we need to get back to dollars here, though, because if you're head of household, single parent or single income family, you who in here thinks that you can have a family on a high K through 12 teacher's salary? You can't. And even if you're, like, yes, the average K through 12 teacher salary is higher in, say, Los Angeles than it is in central Illinois or rural parts of the US, so they compensate for like living expenses, but you still, cannot be single parent head of household on K through 12 salaries. I don't think, I don't, like you can, sure, you can think that K through 12 education needs to be reformed, you can be passionate about teaching, but if you're financially responsible for a family unit, you can't be a teacher in K through 12. It doesn't matter how, like how much you care about it. There's a book so, from the reading that was like, I think they need like 50 hours to get like $1,000 a month. So I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna push us so we can get out of here at a reasonable time level. I'm gonna do the last reading from our textbook and then come back to the MITx reading. So um, yeah, graphics, Bill, I figured I'd put I, I'd put myself up here. <laughs> I had to really struggle with this, Martin, I can tell you. <laughs> so Look, yeah, here's, what's, here, here's what's different, right? So new technology innovations are very slow to enter legacy sectors, right? Remember discussing energy, you know, we did, we invented fire, you know, I don't know how many millions of years that took. Then we, you know, burned trees, we did that for millennia. <laughs> I think the word right. invented was hastily used. <laughs> 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 we Shall we say lightning struck, yeah. right? And we, and we moved to coal, right? Yeah. <laughs> moved to coal, and then you know, we moved to oil, and that's about as far as we've gotten, essentially, yeah, you know, since like, that time. The rate of adoption has increased exponentially, so I think Yes, okay. from, compared <laughs> to <laughs> wood. So similarly, another legacy sector, higher education, you know, what was the last really big, you know, reform in education? So we went from the like, women well, that was an advance, there's no question about it, but, you know, we had the Platonic, you know, academy, and then, you know, a momentous breakthrough around 1500, 1500 years later, we came up with the book, right? That was clearly a great breakthrough. That's from a technological advance period, I mean, that's, that's about it, right? Until, 
we finally figured it out how to use this kind of stuff, and we're starting to figure out how to bring that IT revolution into the classroom. So that presents, if the issue is bringing change into this system, technology obviously can be a change driver. And that's, that's an interesting story. That's not the only you know, change in reform story, as you just pointed out to us, Steph. Um, there's other important changes that have to be considered. But really, within the last you know, five, six years, we've actually seen the entry of um, IT-type tools into, uh, into the classroom setting, uh, uh, classroom setting with potential, potential momentous change. So you know, there's an open question here about whether MOOCs and online education are going to be a disruptive innovation and whether they will disrupt higher education and substitute, in effect, create a new model. You know, is this a Chipotle replaces McDonald's kind of approach. See, I told you I'd steal your metaphor, Martin. Right? Um, and will higher education, how will higher education respond, right? Will it respond with a blended model or will it attempt to keep its existing model? Um, so we'll talk about that for a minute. You know, as we've seen, universities are a pretty deep, um, you know, present a deep problem for this kind of disruption because they are legacy sectors and they, you know, like all legacy sectors, they tended to resist disruptive change. Uh, higher ed institutions of higher education conduct almost no research, almost no R&D on education itself, almost none. It's astonishing. Services sector generally are not particularly good at this, but higher education may lead the pack. Um, there are very perverse pricing issues in higher education, as you all are paying tuition at the moment to understand. Um, it's a very decentralized model. Uh, it's very hard to spread change and spread new ideas, uh, to transition new ideas, because this is a very decentralized system. There's, in legacy sector terms, there's a collective action problem. How do you get collective action across literally thousands of institutions? And I'm just focused on higher education at this point. There's a whole additional story for online in the K through 12 sector. Um, What's happened, you all are familiar with edX, the entry of a nonprofit model here, and frankly, I have to give you know, tremendous credit to Raphael Reif, because I never thought universities themselves would originate you know, potentially disruptive changes for themselves. That kind of violates my rule set, but you know, Raphael you know, basically personally drove a fair amount of this. Um, and you know, his background, you know, he was a poor kid growing up in Venezuela. And, you know, from a family that had not sent children to college. And, you know, he managed to get to go to the technical college in Venezuela, which is a real breakthrough for him. And, um, you know, ends up at MIT through a series of miracles and, you know, becomes president. And, you know, he thinks all the time about that community that he left behind. Um, you know, I know from knowing him and conversations with him, um, just how he saw this online education model as a remarkable new tool to get education and educational platforms everywhere. I mean, it is a remarkable new entrant possibility in education. And he did this Frankly, he drove the creation of edX, and there were corresponding examples coming out of Stanford, Udacity, and Coursera, you know, in a comparable period. But he wanted to do a nonprofit model because he thought it would be better geared to this mission of significantly improving education everywhere. That a new tool set would be at hand. Suppose kids like him, growing up on sandlot baseball lots in Venezuela, you know, could have had access to you know, MIT courses, right? What would that be like, right? So, you know, that, that was his story, and that's the story behind the creation of edX. Um, and, you know, the nonprofit model enables certain kinds of things. A for-profit model enables other things. But one of the interesting features of edX is that it is an open source model. It's an open source technology platform. And people contribute and constantly build up the quality of the technology behind the model. 
it's harder to do that in a for-profit kind of approach. It's still finding its way towards a business model, and we'll talk about it. The other major MOOC providers are listed here. You're familiar with them. Um, they're on for-profit models. You know, the political world took a look at these MOOCs and had different ideological reactions. Um, you know, on the right, to some extent, they saw an opportunity of these free online educational courses as an opportunity to get rid of these pesky left-wing universities that are constantly training the wrong people. Um, on the left, there was, a, there was a sense that, oh, we can finally get rid of tuition, right? have the Bernie Sanders free tuition dream because online education doesn't cost anything and we'll just do that, right? Um, you know, obviously, there's, that's a little bit of magical thinking here on both sides. Uh, but states have begun passing laws doing things like requiring $10,000, you know, BAs and, um, you know, comparable kinds of issues. Um, but the real qu one deep question here is what's going to happen to the residential campus? Right? Is online just going to displace this whole thing? Um, and if not, why not? So the online, I think as all of you understand, it can do some things really well. It's a whole new tool set for visualization, for representation. It offers incredible opportunities for reinforcement and assessment um, that a lecture can't do. Um, you can use feedback loops to, um, and repetition to you know, do continuous assessment, which you know, there's no way your standard college and university lecture class could ever replicate those kinds of capabilities, and they're pretty important. So online is going to have some features that are better than what you know, lectures can do, um, and then potentially if you move the lecture online, then you can free up your classroom for much more interchange and interpersonal kinds of communication um, and more of the learning by doing opportunities that, uh, that Steph was suggesting. So maybe it frees up you know, what the classroom could become. Um, now, vital educational elements remain face to face, right? At least at the moment online can't replicate these. So oral expression, oral presentation, advocacy skills, um, the kind of the way in which you have to organize your expertise to be able to speak about a subject area. Face-to-face um, -face can do this, right? It's really hard to do that effectively at this point with the technology online. Uh, written analysis, um, so far, online writing evaluation leaves a lot to be desired. Um, research, look, in the end, you really do research on lab benches with colleagues, right? It's still quite face-to-face. -face. And you can replicate some of that through simulation and modeling, but a lot of it you can't. So there's a lot that probably needs to stay on the face-to-face -face side. So these kinds of skills. Learning requires a lot of human scaffolding for discourse, arg argumentation, mentoring, for making the case for research, for making the conceptual leap. And a lot of what occurs in the classroom, the socialization process of the classroom drives a lot of learning, right? The kind of back and forth, the kind of competition, the kind of connections between people, friendships that build the kind of community feeling if a class comes together. Those are very powerful learning aids, right? These are very powerful learning tools, and obviously you can't get that stuff sitting in a basement in front of a blue screen, right? So the real question here is, how do you optimize the two sides? How do we let online do what it does best, and how do we let the face-to-face -face piece thrive and do more? Right? That's really the opportunity that we now have, is to completely restructure education with a whole new tool set that in turn will enable that face-to-face -face education to kind of rise to a new level. Right? That's the dream. That's the hope. That's the reform this potentially enables. So it's a human-machine symbiosis, remember? It's J.C.R. Licklider. Mm -hmm. Let 
the computer do what it's good at and let people do what they're good at and you have a symbiosis of the two. That's what we could get in education now. That's the opportunity space. Um, and that's a blended learning model. Um, now, the technology is going to change and it's going to get better at some of these things, right? Um, but that's an ongoing and extended process. What happens to the university, right? For a long time, newspaper journalists were writing articles, oh, ha ha, what's going to happen to universities is what happened to us as journalists, right? All our newspapers went out of business, essentially, <laughs> right? Ha ha, it's going to happen to you too, see? You know, this online revolution is going to drive you under, right? It's problematic if we do that because Frankly, universities create the course content, right? <laughs> they are fairly important institutions, after all, on the content side. They're research engines as well as teaching centers, right? So we kind of need that research in the American system and many other countries. We blend the research model and the teaching model so that there's a lot of learning by doing, more so in the graduate education phase, but there's a lot of learning by doing in that system. So you need these institutions for that stuff. Um, and, you know, if you drive, if you use the model to drive the university model under, you've got these underlying, you know, really deep kind of problems. Um, so there's a question about whether or not universities will adapt. You know, could, uh, and part of that story is bringing learning science to online education, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, it does, the online revolution does create an incredible opportunities. We talked earlier about the possibility of um, you know, worldwide availability of high quality education. Um, it's not a blended model, but it's pretty good, right? It's pretty good material. You can learn a lot from it. Um, that's a, a staggering new opportunity for education worldwide, and that's precisely why Raphael Reif pushed this effort. That was the vision that he saw, frankly. Martin? Okay, so the U.S. probably won't do like a DARPA for education, but I was thinking a lot, especially when I'm talking with this about like JCR Lick 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 Licker. Mm -hmm. is, it, is that right? Yeah. Lick, Lick, I always want to say Lick Licker, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what if they did like a little special institute that just focuses exactly on what the vision is? Because JCR focuses a lot on like the vision of what ARPANET would be. So the vision of like in an ideal <laughs> education world, which I know they have as an initiative, but like have that DARPA intensity with like project managers and like moving initiatives forward. So, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And there was discussion of creating a DARPA within the Department of Education. I have to say I was skeptical about whether that could work because there's no real tradition of R&D in the Department of Education. It's really quite limited. And would they understand the model enough? Interestingly, today, or yesterday, DARPA issued a broad area announcement for, you guessed it, develop a learning machine for lifelong education. That's the challenge, right? So DARPA is now in this territory in some very interesting ways. And actually, the military is in this territory. The military has done more than any other organization by far to use computer gaming as a training tool, right? And computer gaming, as you all I understand probably a lot better than I do, operates on an education kind of model. Right? It's, in other words, learning that game is a very complex process and is acquired over time. And a good game gets that flow right of helping introduce the new, new elements of the game to you and the learning that the game requires in manageable steps and then reinforcing that and reiterating or put you back into feedback loops so that you get it and then driving you to the next stage of the game. It's a very interesting potential educational tool. Probably some of the best work in the country that's being done on that is being done by Eric Cloffer here at MIT, who's developed a whole new set of education games for K through 12. I'm surprised that industry hasn't moved in on the sector. I think it's gradually starting to happen, but that's, that's an interesting part of the story, because the only story here is not MOOCs, right? MOOCs came about because a whole bunch of computer nerds at places like MIT and Stanford saw, wait a minute, we got, we got broadband around the world. We have a whole new delivery mechanism. We've got a whole new tool set. Let's do something, right? And they rushed to fill that void. And, and you know, the edX was created by, you know, folks out of our computer science department. Uh, 
Rashid, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it might be instructive. I'm going to go from past to present. But it might be instructive to take a look at like who when we figured out the printing press was a thing and we could mass print books. Who was the one who decided how do we change? I don't know, maybe from a Socratic like teacher student apprentice relationship to like teacher and then like large lecture hall. Um, what were the sort of driving initiatives or like who started uh, with these kind of large lecture halls and kind of these same maybe like look lighter base like vision for how is education going to work once I have a textbook um, and so now how is it like you need sort of the same people to sort of start taking a look as how is education going to look in the sort of blended learning model and I don't know um, even if MIT or Stanford and all these people have, have, a, have any sort of idea of like what that vision for that blending learning model is. Um, well I think we're starting to look at it in a pretty serious way here and a number of other places as well. Um, you know, kind of good intellectual work is ongoing. Um, let me close off with a couple of points about this. But let's, and let's be sure to hold on to your question, because I think it'll be particularly relevant when we talk about the learning science piece too, Rashid. Um, one thing that we're learning about these MOOCs is, you know, how many people want to go and sit in front of, you know, blue screens in their basement and take a one-off course, right? I mean. You know, I, maybe Bill Gates. <laughs> you know, I have to confess that I probably came to college because I wanted the degree, right? That's probably why I took all those courses, right, in the end. I wanted something that would translate into economic gain for me. That's obviously a profound motivator. So uh, platforms that are organized simply around offering one-off courses without a coherent framework, without a resulting credential, that's not a very good economic model. So the MOOC offerers have been very much moving in the direction of trying to find some kind of certificate that will certify that you've accomplished something. So, um, you know, a lot of people will be just interested in the content, and I've certainly taken MOOC courses just because I was intrigued with the content, but a lot of people are going to be motivated by the, that credential. Um, and, you know, MOOCs are moving in the direction of offering credentials for completing things. I mean, Georgia Tech and Udacity have a master's degree in computer science now, which is available online at a remarkably reasonable price, far low on, in class, you know, on, on campus tuition levels. Um, MIT is very, in a very innovative way doing these mini master's courses. Uh, I think we've got, we did one in an area of MIT is famous for, which is supply chain management, and there's several more to come. The D-Lab has just picked one up, or the development, world development community is doing one. There's going to be more at MIT. That's a very interesting model. Um, you get a, quote, micro master's certificate for completing the course, and you pay you pay because there's got to be assessment, right? And that costs. Somebody has got to do that assessment, so that's going to be a cost. So you pay a modest amount for that assessment, and you take a year-long micro-master's course. And then MIT, if you've done really well, MIT will accept you for a semester on campus, right? Now, they can only offer that to a modest number of the thousands of people that are getting the micro-master's degree. But interestingly, other universities now, once you complete the MIT Micro Masters piece, they are enabling you to come on campus and complete, you know, and get a real master's in the course of an additional semester of work. So that's a very interesting model. Um, that's obviously much more of a blended model. Um, you get a lot of content and information, which online is pretty good at on the online side, and then you really come in for an intensive classroom experience, which is much more the way in which they've designed uh, the MicroMasters here, when you do the real masters, is much more learning by doing. Steph? Well, I just wanted to note that a similar model exists at the Harvard Extension School, except mm -hmm. it's obviously in person. It's the Extension School is perceived as a backdoor into Harvard in the same way that you can take one-off courses at MIT if you talk to a professor and they approve you. So there's lots of opportunities, I think, to take a look at Harvard's graduate extension school model to think about how blended learning might happen. Right, and MIT used to have an extension school, you know, in its early days called the Lowell Institute, which is essentially an adult education program that was available for citizens in Boston. 
very innovative and interesting um, on its old historic campus right across the river in Back Bay. Somehow that got lost in the process, but in a way, MIT has just opened a whole new school, right? That's MITx, and it's a massive worldwide global extension school. So there's a whole new school here. We just haven't fully recognized you yet. And look, lifelong learning may be the best application, right? Because in lifelong learning, in theory at least, you've already learned those explanatory skills, those oral presentation skills. You've already learned those writing skills, right? You've already got a lot of those fundamental pieces, which are largely a part of the undergraduate education scene, but also part of the high school scene. In theory, you've got some of those down. And then what you're in for after, a, you know, doing work in a relevant area, you're in to enhance your career skill set in a lifelong learning setting. The average age of a student at a community college is 29. In other words, they're already in the workforce. 40% of what community colleges now offer are certificates in quasi-professional areas that in effect certify to employers that you've got an additional skill set, right? That's very interesting, right? That lifelong learning opportunity to upgrade your skill set and qualify for you a new set of you know, career areas, that's a really important feature. That's a really important problem for those people who got left behind, right? Through this failure of our higher education system to graduate enough people, right? That's a really interesting, promising option for what online can help us with. Um, and lifelong learning may be the best tool we've got that MOOCs and online education can, can apply to. So those are some, you know, some features of what online education may offer us. Um, the economic model, we're still feeling our way. What's the business model? How are these cost centers going to justify themselves? We're not there yet, but it looks like the certificate kind of micro masters kind of stuff is a probably good way to do this. Lifelong learning may be another very good way um, to do it. Will universities be willing? In other words, so we're sort of at a, at a situation now where universities offer a bunch of MOOCs over on one side, purely online, and then they're running their same old university, right, with lecture classes. And nothing really changes because, as we've discussed, the blended model is what's key to the reform, right, because that will drive a new kind of classroom, the kind of cultural change you're talking about, Steph, right? It could be a driver for this. So unless universities are willing to really think hard about the blended model, then we won't get the revolution that we really need. Right, a kind of transformation of what goes on in the classroom, and then full utilization of this whole new tool set, right, that gives us essentially information and content access. So, you know, we're still going to need, and the term I think you were looking for, Steph, in your argument, and it's a term that we use in the legacy sector analysis, who are the change agents going to be? How are we going to drive change here? And then that gets us into our next reading. But you'd also change the university business model, because I know when I was on like, the executive board for my fraternity, we looked at a lot of internal reports for MIT, and uh, they, they make a lot more money off of grad students than undergrads usually, so like potentially becoming more, because MIT already is pretty much just a research institution, and like... Well, MIT provides huge subsidies to graduate students and a massive system of fellowships, so they're not paying tuition. But they, they end up doing a lot of the prolific work that MIT is known for in research stuff. In terms of the research what, side, what, yes. What's the output of the institute? So so like ideally, like or the way I've seen it usually is like the world becomes a lot. Yes, bigger. research like, output, yeah. graduate students are core, but tuition, believe me, undergraduates are. But tuition. I mean, I feel like a better business model would probably be like getting government funding for certain research that has to happen for the government or something like that. I mean, you get a lot more money that way. Right. We'll see. I'm not yet clear who's going to drive this revolution, um, a blended learning education model. And, you know, MIT is now exploring it. I mean. There's over 90 online classes, and over 90% of MIT students, you all can tell me this is true, according to my friend Sanjay Sarma, VP for online learning. Sanjay says 90% of undergraduate students now have a blended learning experience in their undergraduate careers. Does that sound right to you all? OK, I'm reassured. Um, let me try to lay out, and then we'll have you know 20 minutes plus for discussion. 
Um, the authors of this 2016 report on learning science were Sanjay Sarma, Karen Wilcox of Aero Astro, um, Eric Cloffer, who I mentioned before, Philip Lapel of my office uh, in Washington. The new online platforms, as I said a little, little earlier, came out of computer science departments because they saw these incredible broadband access opportunities. And believe me, they were real. I mean, I was in Egypt about four years ago teaching at the American University of Cairo for about 10 days or participating in, in programs there and lecturing. Um, and you know, I realized that the availability you know, of these things is a complete worldwide phenomenon. And I asked my Egyptian friends, you know, how many people in your country do you think have access to an iPhone? They thought about it and they said, well, you know, between friends and neighbors and connections, we probably have, you know, a pro well over 80% of our population with access to iPhones. So, in other words, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty poor developing country that's an astonishing access system. That's an amazing access system. So there's a whole new delivery vehicle out there. And the computer science departments, logically, saw that first. And so they knew, realized there was a new tool, and they raced to create content to do that. Um, largely, you know, kind of just videoing classrooms, right? Um, and what this group felt was, look, we better figure out how to optimize the online education pieces that we're now doing. How do we understand what's been happening in cognitive science and learning science, which comes out of the education side, and in neuroscience, and take advantage of what they've been learning about learning in the last 15 years, and try and embed those capabilities for better learning into our online courses. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a great aim um, because the MOOC development community hadn't, frankly, seriously in an organized way thought about this. So this report made a real contribution. And there's now a whole research community. And I attended, you know, their annual meeting last month at MIT. And it was a community from all over the world. Universities from everywhere were present. It was fascinating. So the, there were four key recommendations. Integrate learning science from education with cognitive science and neuroscience. These are disciplinary communities that never talk to each other, right? That are in no communication. They're coming up with significant territories, and there could be a lot of benefit from crossovers. So that was one of the points. Um, optimally structured online courses and modules can be an important facilitator for higher education. Emphasis on optimally structured. So there are all these phenomena. And this report looked at a number of the phenomena that affect learning, like mind-wandering, segmenting learning into more bite-sized, understandable, manageable pieces, uh, retrieval learning, and what's, what's the right mix between study and test, right? the reinforcement mechanism. How do you do spaced retrieval? In other words, recovery of information over an extended period of time. How do you optimize that? Uh, what's the role of curiosity? Can you use that as a driver in the learning space? So they began to look at all of these phenomena, which have actually been studied in a number of these fields, and attempted to incorporate them in. I'm not going to try to wander through each one of these elements, but you know, here's some of the, here's some of the literature um, and the MRI scans, you know, show you mind wandering. I mean, that's you know, different parts of the brain are zipping around to different territories, um, and you know, it's a phenomena that needs to be accounted for. It's a, it's a very natural phenomena, right? Mind wandering is, you know, it's Darwinian, right? It's very important for our minds to wander, right? If we're able to completely stay on topic 
you know, the saber-toothed tiger would probably leap through our thatched cottage and finish us off, right? We've got to be keeping an eye out for the saber-toothed tiger, right? So this is very Darwinian. It's an important skill to have mind wandering and the ability to move from topic and area to area. It's an important part of the creativity of the brain. But, you know, it's been viewed historically as an enemy of learning. You know, teachers want students on the task for, you know, that full time of the classroom experience. Um, and are worried when they get distracted. So how do you do this? One approach is to segment learning into bite-sized pieces. So we attempt to do a bit of that in this class with you know, 10, 15 minutes of talking head, i.e. me, and then turning the discussion over to you all um, so that you've got varying things occurring and you never have much more than 10 or 15 minutes. And it probably should be eight to 10, frankly. Um, on a single uh, on a single presenter, and then you move to attempt to absorb the material in the in the dis in the discussion, and have folks who are presenters of that material, you know, develop the content themselves. Where's that graph? Hmm? Where's that graph? Um, you know, it doesn't quite match exactly what I was attempting to show to you, <laughs> but it. It does attempt to show a tutorial versus a lecture model and what the median time frame is um, in any given limit. So in a tutorial one-on-one -on -one setting, you know, you can see that there's more focus on topic over an extended period of time, whereas you know, your median point starts to switch in a lecture model and gets shorter. So, you know, frankly, tutorials are a better way of learning than a lecture, but it's a fairly unaffordable model. Uh, another lesson, uh, retrieval learning. Um, the study, study, in other words, you study and then you study, right? right? You study and you study it again, right? Versus you study and then take a test about it. And over what period of time, which works best, right? So if, if I was imposing this graph, we'd have a test like every week, just so you know. I'm sparing you. but. That would be the optimal model. This is one week retention. Study, study, 42% on re um, re retention, 56% versus study test. In other words, being forced to regurgitate and, and focus on the material definitely does serve a learning purpose. Um, curiosity does make a difference. In other words, if you can bring curiosity into the game, um, and there's something famous in education called an Ebbinghaus curve. Um, the forgetting curve. In other words, people forget. After about a week, it's history, right? And maybe after a month, you remember some vague outline. So there's a profound forgetting curve in the human mind. Um, and can you do spaced retrieval to try and change that curve to retain it longer, right? These are all fundamental issues in learning that this report attempted to start to grapple with, as you saw. Um, Recommendations three and four were to support the profession of learning engineer. So MIT got into this situation where, first of all, there's a lot of faculty resistance on every faculty of these online courses because the faculty is thinking, this stuff's going to put me out of business. Right? They're going to take away my job. Right? So there's always a lot of anger, frustration, resentment when the online course arrives. So MIT very cleverly attempted to get some of its top noted teachers to take, to take on online courses. In other words, if the most respected of your peers are doing these online courses, how can you complain, right? That was a model here. And they were able to do it on the sales point to the faculty member that, hey, you know, how many people have you taught in your lifetime at MIT? A few thousand? Your first course is going to have 30,000, so you're going to be famous, right? That was the sales pitch. That's an attractive pitch. Um, so MIT got its senior faculty and most respected faculty kind of teaching a, a lot early suite of a lot of these courses. And you know, that was interesting. And then they had this experience, right? They gave their best lectures, and then they built in all this assessment and the 10-minute rule and all this kind of stuff into the class. And they had to completely redo their lectures to fit all the requirements that 
Sanjay Sarma and the NX team was forcing on them. So they had to rewrite all their lectures to fit the new formatting. And then, you know, they gave their course and they put it online, which of course every student can take. So then they go back to the regular semester, they're giving their lecture class. No one shows up. They've all taken the class online already. Why are they gonna show up, right? So then the faculty member realized, I'm gonna get zero attendance here unless I develop a completely different kind of content, right? So then the faculty member started to, in interesting kind of ways, rethink what the content was gonna be in the actual face-to-face -face classroom. That's not easy for a faculty member who has never looked at learning science problems or studied MOOCs and studied the technology. So MIT began equipping them with graduate students who were really interested in this stuff, who wanted to use it in their own teaching experiences and decided to dig in, realizing they would be better teachers and potentially more saleable um, if they had this kind of background. So this kind of what MIT called learning engineers were assigned to the faculty member. Now the faculty member was willing to accept a graduate student if the graduate student was studying in their field. In other words, they respected the graduate student for having mastered the professor's own territory. They weren't interested in having graduate students know-it-alls trying to dictate to them from a totally different field, but they were prepared to accept the graduate student if the graduate student had already so shown mastery of their own fields. That was respected learning. So that was kind of another piece in this learning engineer kind of experience at MIT. Um, and it's worked, so we created this whole community of graduate students, we talk about how to bring about the revolution, a whole bunch of graduate students now in MIT are getting experience as learning engineers, helping you know, these ossified faculty members like me learn how to you know, do this fancy MOOC, online blended learning, change around your face-to-face -face classroom, optimized learning experience stuff. And that's, you know, these are all change models. These are all potential ways in which change agents uh, can operate. But there's a very deep you know, question about how do we do a change model within a higher education legacy sector because it's a very decentralized system. And MIT's learning lessons and other universities that are doing this are learning lessons. But how do we exchange these lessons and get these lessons adopted through the community? That's a tough assignment. That's where all of Steph's points about her implication was how do we get change agents willing to step up to the plate and drive this stuff? And get them respected, as you just noted. Yes. All right. We've got 20 minutes for Q&A. Okay. Lily, it's That's you. Me. I will start. Which one would you like me to start with? Whichever one you prefer. Mm -hmm. That's tough. OK. Let's start. We ended with the um, MITx online learning. So let's go to that paper and discuss it. Okay. Um, a couple of people had questions, including myself, as to what subject areas the uh, online or blended learning could be, or what subject areas could readily adapt those practices, and if it's just impossible to really implement this sort of style in some subject areas. So, for example, I would not have wanted to take this course if it was on online course. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a three hour attention span sitting at my computer. And I wouldn't have, you know, sure you can start, um, you could have a discussion group and everyone tunes in on their own devices. And so you could have this interact, pseudo interactive discussion. But I, there's just something about sitting around a seminar table and interacting with other humans um, for me. So I wanted to hear what, what, what you all thought about the applicability of the MITx in certain fields. Yeah, I've always questioned how either it could be improved or whether it is suitable for a lot of engineering classes. Um, just from like my experience, both as like a student and then like as a TA grading stuff, like it's not like so many of the questions are not just about like getting the right answer. It's about like making sure you understand like how to approach the problem. Like did you just make like one little mistake along the way and that gives you the wrong answer? Like a lot of times there's not even numbers involved, and so I know like with they did solid state chemistry is one of the classes that was like first really involved with edX 
And I know the students would get really frustrated with it because they're like, oh, like I rounded this number wrong and that's why my answer's off or like all these like little things that <clears throat> edX just like wasn't sensitive enough to pick up on. And so I don't know if that's a question of the technology improving such that like we have better like machine learning, artificial intelligence to tell what students are doing or whether that's just like a limitation that will be uh, present with this field. Yeah, I think building on to that and from our earlier discussion about um, whether teachers and professors still have a role in a very much more uh, online or automated education is that one of the important features of being physically in a classroom or interacting with the TA like yourself or the students or the professor is that their most important, even more valuable skill of theirs as opposed to knowing their material inside and out is knowing um, like the, the having the teaching ability to identify what your problem is and like understand the student psychology and understand um, the learning process so that they can, they can't just point at your answer and say this is wrong because you did this but understand why you're wrong and where and, and then redirect you and, and sort of course correct you so that's I think that will always be an important element of a truly well-rounded education and you only get that from interacting with other people that's right. I, I do think the technology is a sense now, you know, the face-to-face -face component is critical <coughs> in a lot of uh, learning, especially in a class like this, right? But um, what's to say 5, 10, 20 years from now, we can't all just slap a pair of VR goggles on and then we're sitting in a simulated room and then Bill doesn't need to fly in for every lecture. <laughs> you get that same experience. Great idea, Kevin. How do we market it? You, you, know, you get the, the same experience of sitting around, but you don't have to leave your couch or wherever you are. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's allowable and achievable, but I think... As it stands now... But like we don't have to physically yeah. be, be in the same room, but be, having there's still a role for a human educator mm -hmm. right, and for right, human right. students to interact. Mm -hmm. So far, I think Chloe and Kevin, so far our ability and much of our communication is not the words that we're mouthing. It's the expressions we use. It's eye contact. It's hand expressions. Um, there's just a whole range of stuff that accompanies what we're actually saying that we use as part of our communication systems. And so far, the technology has not been precise enough to enable us to capture that incredible depth um, that face-to-face -face allows. And to some extent, it's frustrating. In other words, because that mix of you know, non-spoken communication skills doesn't get fully picked up, people are frustrated by the experience, right? Um, this is a notorious problem in conference calls, even in video conference calls, right? People don't quite see what the other person is driving at or trying to communicate because this raft of other kinds of communication is not picked up. Now, that's not to say that this won't get a lot better, right? And we've obviously moved to a whole new level of high definition in a lot of different, you know, in a lot of different machinery. So it may well get better. At the moment, it's not good enough yet to substitute for the being next to you. I, mean, I didn't intend them though, because we're kind of seeing how, oh, it's not how the, the original is, but uh, form follows function. And because it has a different form, you have other functions that we wouldn't have here. So if it's all in line, then like other people can be telling me what I'm doing, what, what they got wrong, or I can get recommendations. Yeah. The thing is like the system hasn't been perfected as well. Um, or like you said, you don't want to stay in a three-hour lecture. Like I usually watch like videos at like three X if they're like educational, and I'll just go through the content. <laughs> That's why I talk fast. It's like, hey, okay, and then but I get a lot more done, and I just focus on the stuff I want to do. Um, so there's new functions you can do, or you can like another another really important aspect that I thought thought of from like an organizational standpoint is like in this class, certain people are going to talk up more. Um, and other people that are, might be more shy might not want to say something. So that's why, like, you have people that online, you know, are talking heads, but physically, like, won't say a word. Um, so that adds new dynamics, and depending on the personalities, other people can um, can excel, right? Um, that's are, why I try to make some of you, all of you, be discussion leaders a lot in the course yeah. of this. I mean, are the issue also is like racism, uh, equity, sexism. Like, if you don't know the gender or the background of a person, you only judge them based on the ideas, right? Or the content of their characters and uh, 
layer that you get, right? Um, I think. Yes, I mean, sorry, we're doing so. Um, well, I was I was gonna make a point of like, so that allows other people to lead or like excel in, yeah. in this. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides to every coin. So I, I agree the anonymity of the internet could definitely be a, a huge plus. But I mean, when you have people trolling your classes. Yeah, that's and still so you lash out just as quickly. Have anonymity. So the thing is, yeah. like, the, the post is like Piazza, right? Like, your post can be anonymous, but the constructors know who you are. And like, I think one, one of my roots is that. <laughs> so they can just like say like, oh, please. Or like, they'll just kick you out. And that, yeah. that's very like an 80-20 Pareto principle where, I mean, I don't think everyone's just going to start trolling it unless it becomes like a thing. But like, it's an interesting day. Yeah. Even if we got to the point where the technology, well, if you, even if we got to the point where the technology was perfect, then like we could simulate being in this class together. I mean, I think there's still a lot of value in the fact that like on my way home, I'll pass by the Mackie Lounge and I'll you know talk to someone about their next startup idea. I think there's, I mean, just like when we talked about decentralizing manufacturing, there's a lot of know-how and, and innovation capability embodied in just having things together physically. Um, but also with the whole blended learning model, I don't think anyone's really trying to say that we're going to throw away like in face-to-face -face interaction or anything like that. Um, and then back to your original point about what does it like learning, like online learning work really well for? I think right now my experience has been it works pretty well, um, or it's at least better for quantitative kind of classes. Um, but I've been working over the last semester and like setting up an undergraduate law class here, and uh, one of one of the initiatives is putting on a lot of the content online. And what we found that the MOOC kind of format allows us to do is give maybe some of the instructional video in bite-sized pieces online beforehand, and it opens a lot of in-class time to actually do like a case discussion. <laughs> and opens up new opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, oh, I was just, I was actually I'm going to add to yours. I participated in a Europe in STS uh, for a year uh, with a professor named Louis Pucciarelli, who started off in mechanical engineering, has a PhD also in science and technology society, I think at the same time. Um, and he taught for a long time, I think, in Aero Astro as well. So he's very started, you know, professional emeritus uh, <coughs> now. And he's starting a program called Liberal Studies in Engineering and uh, one of the challenges that we had when producing modules for the program is uh, that it, although it did have the quantitative components that you're saying I think are pretty easy to communicate, there was a lot of nuances behind the, the materials that we had selected that made it really complicated for us to convey both the content and the, to then ask questions about it. And I think one of the examples um, that most stood out to me was when we were doing a module on wells and uh, specifically cr implementing wells in <coughs> the developing world in a community in Tanzania, um, there was a drawing of a well that had been built, I think, in the 16th or 17th century that he had scanned and put into the module, but it was not the the mechanism by which the water was pulled up from the ground was not very clear. And like the piston just was not very well drawn. Um, and that prevented a lot of, I guess, I, like I was the one who was like writing a lot of the material and then it was then sent to me and then I had to do it and then I had to give him feedback on my process of doing it. Um, and it prevented a lot of my ability to actually do the problems. So I think that's one of the really interesting things about MOOCs as well, and especially multidisciplinary MOOCs, that there's so many nuances behind the material that even if the, the content seems fairly straightforward, if you have no way to interact, or rather if you don't have an immediate way to interact with the instructor, it does add a, an extra layer of complication in your ability to solve something. Um, and I think that that's precisely why we benefit from the blended model, because then you can come to class and say, hey, professor, you know, you uploaded this image in the problem set, and I have no idea, you know, how the piston actually operates. Could you explain this to me more thoroughly, or could you redraw it and re-upload it? So part of the motivation, by the way, for filming this class is for us to think about whether or not we take more of the lecture segments online and then had, have even a more of an organized discussion focus you know, in the face-to-face -face classroom. So that's one of the, part of the reason of the filming here is to create an online course, but it's also possible to use this for more of a blended model here. 
So I wanted to come uh, bring something up that Bill mentioned earlier, which I think will also transition us into the Von Billion and Weiss reading. Um, Bill mentioned uh, graduate programs online. So you complete a year-long uh, certificate sort of program and then can complete the remainder of your graduate work on site. Um, I think that's a really interesting model and idea. So I could see that working well for things like, um, oh, first of all, oh, oh, I could see that working well for things like maybe business, um, engineering, computer science, et cetera. And those graduate programs are typically quite expensive and can be two to three years. And unlike a lot of PhD programs or science programs, you don't, it's not paid for. So we're talking maybe $50,000 a year for two to three years. Um, which brings me to uh, something that came up in Bill's reading, which is um, student loans and increasing levels of student loans. And I was doing a little bit of research. Does anyone have have a, uh, any idea what the current outstanding student loan debt is in the U.S.? Isn't there a trillion? Yeah, 1.5 trillion. <laughs> And they're not collateralized, um, and the default rates are increasing. So I think they are. Yeah. I thought that, I, last I heard, I thought they were down. Mm. Huh. Not according to this 2017 statistics. Crap. What I heard was in 2016. So. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, could the could the um, master's program blended online, then a, a concatenated or shortened? Uh, on-site learning be a really, I don't know, in, in, improve the situation with student loan debt while still uh, qualifying the person with a graduate degree. I would just be curious what the breakdown is between different fields, because I know for like MBAs and like law school, so much of it is like building your network while you're there. So like people are willing to take on like hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans just to like have connections to like the Harvard community or whatever. Mm -hmm. So like if that is only a small section of like the total loans that are outstanding, then I think this could be impactful. But if that's like outweighing it. I'm not worried about that class repaying the loans. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but that's still, like, that would still be considered part of the statistic, right? Because like the first year out, they might owe like $300,000 in loans. Um, and while they are paying it back, like I think they would still be willing to take out $300,000 of loans regardless yeah. of new technologies. This yeah. also assumes the goodness of the programs that are putting out these courses. There's a lot of, I think, predatory, uh, like the, what is the name, the, the, the one that just got shut down, that was really bad, University From of the University. Yeah, yeah. 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 worst case <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, there's, yeah, it sort of presumes the goodness it, of a lot of these organizations. Well, yeah, we're assuming they're all like elite ones where it's like, yeah, sure you're gonna get something really. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and it just, and it also presumes that they're useful. Like there's a, like there's an instrumentality or a utility but like coefficient that you gain from having participated in these courses. And I don't know if the return on investment is going to be good for someone who doesn't already have sort of a foundational degree in something. Like it, it assumes that, this, that the job market is willing to, uh, to accept the people who are graduating with this knowledge. And I don't know if that's true right now. There's a really good breakdown on four year universities, by the way, not just um, graduate programs so yeah um, so Lily do you want to make a make a closing set of points about these two readings uh, yeah pay off your student loans and don't default on them or else our entire economy can collapse <laughs> <laughs> again <laughs> again well these are the kinds of number you know there's a critical default number just as with the housing market and all right so we need to all buy shorts <laughs> i don't know how to use shorts oh, actually, not collateralized. Thing about, yeah this being a bubble like the, the education bubble yeah. yeah another big thing about peter teal uh, like uh since we bought him up in the first class i think my uh, my favorite example is like there's federally subsidized student loans and uh, if you get clever, there's like you use your federally subsidized student loans to like invest properly and then like flip those because uh, those are inherently like safer. So like, even if you don't want to, uh, I should say like there are a lot of options to pay back your student loans. <laughs> yeah, you can so always... Lily, bring us to a couple of key conclusions about the two readings. Conclusions. Um, let's see. Good in my notes. I think in general. The readings led us to believe that online learning, or at least blended learning, is going to 
um, increase in usage or popularity, whether the institutions, the universities like it or not. Um, and I don't know, that's, I think I covered everything else that I thought. Good, let me do just a quick wrap up. Um, Freeman taught us about the talent base and you know how it's going to affect the innovation system, and you know made us aware of the fact that the S and T talent base is going to be a pretty key component of U.S. you know overall comparative advantage as other people move to copy the model. Uh, Romer's core point was that government policy is focused on really on capital supply, um, and you know, and really on the demand side of the equation, right? and that the talent supply system really was not a particularly significant federal government focus. Uh, it probably needs to be, because that's a very important factor in innovation, as we've discussed earlier with his prospector theory. Um, and then he drove us to look at higher educational institutions and how they don't get the economic signaling that would lead them to increase the supply. And he helped us think about what some of the barriers were and how you could change that economic signaling to change the way in which the higher education system dealt with the supply question. Katz and Golden um, taught us about the tie between the ever increasing technology requirements of the economy since the Industrial Revolution. We've been on a rising curve and it may be accelerating. And then they demonstrated for us how important it is to keep the education curve, the talent base, ahead of that curve, playing off of that curve. If you let them cross, like we did in the 1970s, then you start to drive towards pretty serious economic inequality problems because you're leaving a large part of your population behind, unable to get back on that rising parallel and stay up with the technology curve and earn the corresponding incomes. Uh, Baumel alerted us to the fact that education for invention and innovation, by the way, looks different than standard education systems in science and technology today, which are more geared towards, historically, towards you know, incremental advances. Um, MIT's online education report um, got us thinking about learning science, how you could apply learning science to really optimize both the online model and the blended learning model. Um, and then the reading from the textbook you know, showed us a set of the challenges for online education, how it's a potentially disruptive tool in a legacy sector education system, and got us thinking about who are the change agents that might really drive the optimal model, which is really probably a blended learning model. <laughs>